thanks. So, uh, yeah, so I'm Chris Camejo. I run the compliance practice here at Trusted Sec, and uh, I've been a PCI QSA for, I hate to say it, I think 17 years now. So, um, yep, I've been the boring compliance guy for a long time. Um, also do ISO 27001, CMMC, a whole bunch of other compliance frameworks, but PCI has always been the, the bread and butter. So uh, we're going to be talking a little bit today about a new requirement in PCI 4.0 about documenting scope. And so there's the requirement itself, and then there's the deep dive into, well, one of the big things we run into as QSAs is people who think they have their scope right, but don't actually understand PCI's arcane rules for scoping. So we're going to dive into those. So we'll start off a little bit with that new scope documentation requirement talk about what's in scope for PCI, how outsourcing affects that, get through the system component, the technology scope, as well as the physical scope. And then once we have that better understanding of scope, we'll go back and revisit that, that actual scope documentation requirement in version 4.0. And I've got a few things at the end. If we have time, uh, there's a bunch of other controls that are related to scope that we can get into. And then just other sort of weird scoping scenarios that, um, that may actually come up more during Q&A uh, because of course, everybody's got different weird network stuff going on. So there's, there's not really any easy answers for some certain scenarios. So starting off, getting into that new scope documentation requirement. It is requirement 12.5.2. And the, the motivation on this is, is um, organizations have to document and confirm their scope is accurate every 12 months or after a significant change. So there's these seven bullet points in the, the boxes down below here that are the bullet points underneath this requirement. We're gonna get into these much more detail later. That's the revisited part towards the end of this, uh, this whole presentation. But uh, it's worth noting this requirement uh, came into effect with version 4.0 on April 1st, 2024. So you should have this documentation in place today and you will need it for your next assessment. Uh, and of course, the first thing that comes up, everybody always asks is, okay, well, 12 months are significant change. What is a significant change? So this screenshot is pulled straight out of section seven of PCI DSS requirements and testing procedures document that you can download off PCI's website in their document library. And it gives us this highlighted vague statement that a significant change is highly dependent on the configuration of a given environment. So that's not very helpful but they do give us these examples listed in the bullet points down below. So that's what I usually recommend is go in your own policies, document what you believe to be a significant change in your own environment, and you should at least include these bullet points. Uh, as a QSA, like if I see a policy that just covers these bullet points here, I'm not gonna ask too many more questions, but if you're missing some of them, I'm gonna ask why they're not in there and, and I'm gonna need you to justify that. So. Um, so that's a good place to start there for your significant change. There are a few other requirements in PCI DSS that also trigger with a significant change. So just keep that in mind and try to write your policy for, for all those different scenarios. And so the next big thing I often hear is organizations say, well, our QSA tells us what our scope is. Um, that's not how this is supposed to work. So again, screenshot straight out of PCI DSS that uh, section six in this case, that the highlighted bits make very clear that you as the entity, this is like whether you're a merchant or a service provider, you're the entity, are expected to retain documentation to show how you determined your scope. And they also say down here at the bottom that this is not the same or intended to be replaced by the scope confirmation performed by your assessor during the annual assessment. So, uh, so yeah, as your QSA, if I'm showing up to do your annual assessment, you should be able to show me, here's what you think is in scope. And I'm just confirming that your understanding of your own scope is accurate. Um, it, we've kind of had some wiggle room on that in the past, but now with requirement 1252, it's a lot more clear that no, you, all this stuff, this text you're looking at right here got added. It is very explicit that you need to understand and document your own scope. So that doesn't mean you can't hire a QSA to help you understand and document your scope, but that's something you want to do well before your assessment, not like wait until your, your assessor shows up, tells you that you don't have this requirement in place and now you're, uh, you're gonna miss your reporting deadline. The good news is this requirement is not included in any of the self-assessment questionnaires or SAQs. I'm gonna use that SAQ abbreviation here. 
Uh, that means that only merchants that are completing self-assessment questionnaire D and service providers, and service providers are never eligible for the shorter SAQs, must fully uh, must complete that requirement 1252 that we just showed. So in theory, this is also applicable to merchants completing a ROC or report on compliance, the level one audit, but there's some nuance there because PCI gives us this lovely FAQ number 1331, and you can get this off PCI's website that tells us, first off, again, service providers cannot use SAQ eligibility criteria. So sorry, service providers, this is for merchants only. Uh, but merchants that meet the eligibility criteria for one of the shorter SAQs can use that SAQ to determine which requirements are applicable in the ROC. So if you would qualify for SAQ P to PE or SAQA or any of those other short ones, but your transaction volume is so high, it puts you in level one and you have to do a ROC, you can still just say, nope, 1252, not applicable in my ROC because we qualify for the, uh, the shorter SAQ type. So, um, so some good news there. Uh, talking about service providers, and, and just to be clear here, uh, a merchant, just for terminology, a merchant is anyone that is taking payment cards for goods or services they provide. So if you're buying donuts off me or you're paying us for consulting services with a credit card, we are the merchant. Service provider is somebody who's not providing those goods and services and taking payment by a card. They're the ones that are kind of the man in the middle that are doing your credit card processing for you or fraud alerting or kind of any part of that, that payment ecosystem. So, um, so always think of it that way is if, if you're taking payment cards to put money in your own bank account, you're a merchant. If you are taking payment cards to put money in somebody else's bank account or keep money from being stolen from their bank account, you're a service provider. So if you're a service provider, two brand new requirements related to 1252, uh, both of them become effective after March 31st, 2025. So you get some time on these. They're telling you as a service provider, you have to do this validation every six months, not every 12 months. And they also tell you, you have to do a scope review after any significant changes to your organizational structure and they want that scope review to be documented. So this is above and beyond your 1252 responsibility. You've got to do this other documented internal review of, okay, we've, we've changed our org chart. What does that mean for our PCI responsibilities and, uh, and the scope and the applicable controls? So merchants, don't worry about it. So now getting into the details, what's actually in scope for PCI DSS? So we can help with the totally unhelpful official definition from section four of the PCI requirements and testing procedures. Uh, it primarily applies to anything that's storing, processing, and or transmitting cardholder data and or sensitive authentication data. A lot of definitions there. We're going to get into that very shortly. The rest of the definition refers to connections to and impacting the security of the things that store, process, transmit it, cardholder data and or sensitive authentication data. Uh, some other terms that'll come up frequently are account data and primary account number or PAN. And so to understand scope, we need to understand what all of these terms mean. So account data is kind of our biggest umbrella term. And it covers both cardholder data, which is abbreviated as CHD, and sensitive authentication data, which is abbreviated SAD or SAD. So uh, the definition of cardholder data is primarily driven by that primary account number or the PAN, which is that 15 or 16 digit number displayed right on the front of the card that we all just call a credit card number. The cardholder's name and the expiration date are also considered to be cardholder data, but only if they are in the same environment as the PAN. So if you have something going on where you process cards, but you need to keep that cardholder name around for some reason, and you separate that cardholder name from the PAN and move it out into some other environment, that cardholder name is no longer cardholder data, it's no longer account data, it's no longer in scope for, for PCI DSS. Uh, Similarly, there's some tricks we can actually use to render the PAN itself out of scope. And that's our little box up here in the top right. 
where if you discard all of the, the digits of the PAN, except for the last four digits and the bank identification number called a BIN, which is usually the first six or the first eight now. Uh, there's some recent, it always used to be the first six and they've recently changed it to um, some brands. Some banks are using the eight digits. Uh, there's an FAQ on PCI's website that goes into detail on this. But uh, you take that card number, you get rid of everything except for that first six or eight and the last four. It is no longer considered a card number, no longer a PAN, therefore no longer cardholder data, therefore no longer account data, therefore no longer in scope for PCI. Same applies if you do uh, uh, hashing, uh, cryptographic hashing of the PAN, and there's certain specific requirements for that in 4.0 for how you do that hashing. Tokenization is another method of doing that. So, um, so yeah, once you do that, no longer PAN, no longer in scope. But the key thing, common misconception, um, I always hear, oh, well, we, we encrypt the card number everywhere it goes, so we're OK. A regular encrypted PAN is still in scope if that decryption key is present anywhere in the environment. Because if the hacker can break in and steal the encrypted card data, they can steal the decryption key. So, um, so still in scope, you have to protect that encrypted PAN. The only exception is if you are sending that, um, that encrypted PAN to a third party that does not have the key. So let's say you're making your backups and sending your backups off to Iron Mountain or wherever, your backups may be encrypted, but you are not sending the decryption key to your backup provider. Your backup provider is not in scope for PCI because they don't have the decryption key to decrypt that data that you've sent them. So that's it for cardholder data. Uh, getting on to sensitive authentication data, that consists of the full mag stripe or the equivalent data that comes out of a chip card, the CVV code, that little three digit number on the back, and the pin or the pin block. And when you put cardholder data and sensitive authentication data together, it turns a payment card into a multi-factor authentication system. Uh, cardholder data is something you know, like you as a merchant or service provider are allowed to save cardholder data, store it long term. So, uh, so that's the something that you know because anybody could know your card number. Uh, they could have stolen it from wherever, just like they steal passwords. The sensitive authentication data proves that you physically have the card because one of the rules is you as a merchant or service provider can never store sensitive authentication data after authorization is complete. So, uh, so it must show that you have the card because that data should never be stored anywhere else. The only way to have it is to physically flip that card over, read the CVV off the back, physically swipe or tap the card against something or type in that pin number that, uh, that you have. So, uh, so remember our definition of the PCI scope, it applies to account data that is processed, processed or transmitted. So even if you don't store any of this data, you're still in scope if you're handling it because it applies to processing and transmission as well. And so this is going to drive the rest of our scope. Some other misconceptions I run into, uh, organizations will often incorrectly omit certain payment processes because they think either PCI only applies to electronic account data, they think that digital scans of documents don't count because they're images rather than text data. Uh, they don't think about voice over IP audio. And these are all in scope. Um, I don't necessarily agree with all of them because it's really hard to extract um, account numbers from voice over IP audio. Um, but yeah, AI is getting fancier nowadays. But according to PCI and the FAQ numbers listed here, all of these things are absolutely in scope for PCI DSS. So your paper documents, your digital images, your voice over IP audio, all in scope. Uh, I usually see this with call centers where we, we talk to call centers, they think they have a nice small scope, they have their little P2P e terminals that everything's encrypted. And then I ask about, uh, well, how, how are you getting the card numbers? It's coming in over voice over IP. And now they find out that their entire voice over IP networks in scope. So um, not a good thing. Uh, and that applies even if those calls are not recorded because once again, processing and transmission counts as in scope. So your voice over IP is transmitting account data, it counts. So 
I, that's the bad news. Um, the good news is I, I often have clients that get overwhelmed by PCI because they think the scope of the requirements are broader than they actually are. So I, I threw a few examples here, just random requirements uh, to, to kind of demonstrate. Like if we look at this, um, this first bullet point here under 221, it says covers all system components. And 1263 just says personnel receive security awareness training without any real qualification on that. And the thing is, these requirements only apply to people, processes, and locations and systems that are in scope for PCI DSS. If they're not in scope, we wouldn't be applying requirements to them. So the way I think of it is there's this sort of like invisible implied in scope in every one of these requirements. So we could re really read this as covers all in scope system components or in scope personnel receive security awareness training. So just always think about that as you're as you finish doing your scoping exercise and you start going through the requirements, have that imaginary in scope and all the requirements so that you, you don't get overwhelmed and think you have to train absolutely everybody in your organization or apply this control to every system in your organization. And this is why doing the scoping right is so important is it lets you, lets you cut people out of the scope and, and apply these requirements more narrowly. And PCI itself has actually narrowed down some of their requirements further. Uh, some of these controls are more explicit about their scope, and you can see some examples here that specifically refer to components that store cardholder data, uh, that refers to wireless environments that connect to the CDE or transmit account data, physical access to sensitive areas within the CDE, whatever sensitive areas means. So. Keep your eyes open. It's important to read these requirements very closely and look for these terms. So, and understand that certain requirements only apply to subsets of the in-scope environment, helps reduce your compliance burden, makes it less of a headache for you. And of course, that means we're going to need to understand what these terms like sensitive area and connected to the CDE actually mean. So we'll be covering those shortly. So then we get into outsourcing, uh, another area where there's huge impacts on scope. So, uh, so there may be aspects of compliance that you've outsourced, but that is not a loophole to ignore certain requirements. Uh, my rule, and, and just in general, every applicable requirement must be met by someone. And that may be by your organization, maybe by a third party, maybe by a combination of both parties. But if there's some requirement that would otherwise apply and nobody's doing it, that's a compliance problem. So uh, requirement 1285 tells us, and that's the, the box down here kind of summarizes it, tells us that when we bring third parties into our scope, we must document who's responsible for meeting each applicable requirement. And 1292, requirement 1292 tells those third parties, the service providers, that they must help their, their customers understand those responsibilities. And that 1292 is a new requirement in version 4.0. Uh, it always used to be a struggle in the past with these poor merchants that would work with us and we'd try to figure out like best guess, what's, what's the merchant on the hook for, what's the service provider doing for them and we wouldn't get much help from the service provider. So, uh, so we have this new requirement, 1292, service providers have to help. Many of the big ones are just publishing these responsibility matrices on their websites, so you can just download them. Uh, otherwise, it doesn't have to be a matrix. You can do it over email, you can do it over phone, but they have to help you understand who's responsible for what, and you need to document that as part of requirement 1285. So from a, a service provider perspective, anything you're doing for your customer that meets one of their PCI requirements brings you into scope for PCI even if you're not handling any account data. So for example, if you're a co-location data center, you're providing physical security for your customer systems. If they have cardholder data on those systems, well, now you're on the hook for the requirement nine, which is the PCI requirement for physical security. Uh, if you're a managed security service provider, you're collecting and reviewing log data for a customer and uh, PCI has requirement 10 is all about logs and reviewing them and taking action on them. Well, they're relying on you to meet their requirement 10 obligations. So that puts you as a service provider in scope for PCI. So, so the scope is broader than just the people that store process transmit cardholder data. It's that 
you're affecting the security of the environment as a third party provider by doing the physical security for them or doing those log reviews or, or remote support or whatever it happens to be. So the end of that story is documenting that division of responsibilities is absolutely critical to understanding the scope of the merchant, the scope of the service provider, the scope of the service provider's service provider, because even service providers outsource things even further, and, um, and understanding who's on the hook for what. The other one I get is kind of the, the extreme version of this is the, I've outsourced absolutely everything. Uh, I don't handle, the, I'm a merchant, but this third party does everything for me. Not a single card number goes through my network. They're a turnkey solution that does, does it all and just money magically shows up in my bank account, which is great. I love seeing those because it gets your scope absolutely as small as you can possibly get it, but you still have a scope. And uh, this is what, Self-assessment questionnaire A4, SAQA, is specifically for this outsourced everything to a third party scenario. Uh, at a bare minimum, every merchant, every service provider that outsources things will be on the hook for the five sub requirements of requirement 12.8, which is what we've got the, these first five here. And these are all related to management of third parties. This is the keeping a list of your third parties, written agreements, they're gonna protect that data on your behalf. You've done some due diligence on them and, and you're monitoring their plants. The one I just mentioned, you've documented which requirements are managed by the third party on your behalf. And then the last one we've got is requirement 12101 for an incident response plan. And if you've outsourced absolutely everything, this may be a very simple incident response plan along the lines of, well, if our third party gets breached and they tell us, we will tell our customers that the third party got breached and lost their data. And that may be the extent of it, because if you don't have any other involvement in the security of that card data, there's not much else you can do. So, um, but you have to have something. So, so these are your six requirements. If you've outsourced absolutely everything, SAQA, um, there are more requirements in SAQA that could apply, but you'll see they say things like apply to the web server, apply to paper records. If you don't have any of that stuff, this is what you're left with. So let's get into the fun technical stuff. So when we talk about scope, uh, we, can, we can think about it as layers. And at the core, we've got the systems that are actually storing, processing, or transmitting account data. Next are the systems that have unrestricted connectivity to the systems that store, process, transmit account data. And we'll get into exactly what unrestricted connectivity means shortly. And these two top layers here combined, this is the cardholder data environment or the CDE. And you'll see that term over and over and over again. Uh, one of the, the biggest mistakes I see is organizations that think of the CDE as like a specific place on the network, a specific VLAN or network segment. And instead you should think of it as sort of a flag that you attach to certain system components. So this database is CDE, this web server is CDE, this workstation is CDE, this network switch or router is CDE. And if, if any system component stores, processes or transmits account data or has unrestricted connectivity to something that stores, processes, transmits account data, give it that CDE flag and you're going to have to apply all of the CDE requirements to it regardless of which network segment it happens to be on. So beyond the CDE, we have the systems that provide security to the CDE, that support your PCI requirements, that segment the CDE from the out of scope systems. And these security system components, they're, they're part of what are called critical systems. We'll get into that in a, in a moment. Uh, beyond those security systems, we have anything else that can connect to the CDE or impact the security of the CDE. So these two bottom ones here, in scope for PCI, but they are not part of the CDE. So when I said about reading requirements closely, all those ones where you have sort of the implied in scope where it says all system components, that requirement would apply to all four of these categories because it says all system components. When you look at one that says, well, this applies to wireless networks that connect to the CDE, okay, now we know how to define our CDE, so now we can find those wireless networks that connect to the CDE. And, uh, and we'll get into what qualifies as a connection shortly here because that, that's a whole other rabbit hole to go down. 
So um, for systems to be out of scope, they have to be isolated from the CDE and basically not meet any of these other criteria above. So they can't store process transmit, not on the same subnet or VLAN because that would be unrestricted connectivity, can't connect to the CDE, can't impact the security of the CDE in any way. So, um, so we'll get into what isolated means as well. So as you start your scoping exercise on the technology side, here's the start of a flow chart for this. Big question number one, is this thing part of the CDE? Does it store process or transmit? And account data's presence, no matter how few records, no matter how briefly they're there, it counts. So, so you could have one record goes through a system once per year for half a millisecond, it's transmitting account data, it's CDE. Uh, don't forget your network and security devices that account data passes through, your switches, your routers, your firewalls. They're transmitting CDE. They're are transmitting cardholder data. They're in scope. So now that we've flagged all our systems that are storing, processing, transmitting, we need to flag those systems that have unrestricted connectivity. And generally, that means anything on the same VLAN. Uh, it can also mean things that are spread across multiple VLANs if there's no meaningful firewalling going on between those VLANs. So to show it visually, here's an example. Two systems on the same VLAN. Our red server here is storing, processing, and or transmitting account data. And our workstation can communicate directly with that, uh, that server because th there's no firewall. There's unrestricted connectivity here. There's, the firewall is not in the way of that communication. So that means our workstation has unrestricted connectivity. It's part of the CDE. It's in scope, uh, in scope as CDE. A similar scenario. We've got sort of a same, same setup here, but now we've got two separate networks hanging off that firewall. Uh, and you can see our firewall here from our workstation A to our server B, any service except. That is not meaningful separation. That's, you might as well not even have a firewall there. So that is also unrestricted connectivity. And that means that workstation is part of the cardholder data environment. So, uh, so think about that. That's your your thought process here when you're trying to figure out unrestricted connectivity. Is if thing A can hit thing B on any pro any protocol, any service, that's unrestricted. So now that we've defined our CDE based on those two criteria, we have to find the rest of the systems that are in scope but not part of the CDE. So anything that can communicate with the CDE either directly via open ports in the firewall or indirectly via VPNs, jump boxes, virtual hosts, whatever, that's all considered connected to and is in scope. Uh, anything that provides security or segmentation to the CDE, so like your firewall that's separating your in scope from your out of scope, the firewall itself uh, is in scope uh, because it's providing segmentation, your intrusion prevention, your anti-malware, all the rest of your security stuff is in scope under this provide security category. Uh, systems that impact security, this is kind of the hardest category to think about. And it helps to think like a hacker here. So think of like a DNS server. Uh, it may not connect to or provide security to the CDE, but if a hacker compromises your DNS server, they could start doing cache poisoning attacks. And if your CDE systems are using that DNS server, that could cause the CDE systems to connect to and send data to malicious systems. Well, that sounds like impacting security to me. Therefore, that DNS server needs to be considered in scope. Uh, and then our last category here is anything that supports PCI requirements will also be considered in scope, even if it can't otherwise connect to or affect the security of the CDE. The reality is that most things that will fall into this category will likely be in one of the other categories up above as well. So don't get too hung up on which of these categories a system falls into. Uh, it's, you know, all we really need to know is if the system fits any of these categories, at which point it's in scope and we can move on. Um, many systems will fall into multiple categories here. Like a, a domain controller would provide security to the CDE it would impact the security and configuration of the CDE and support PCI requirements. But that nuance doesn't matter. All that matters is, yeah, we figured out that thing's in scope, add it to the list. 
so let's visualize some connections. So this is our example of a direct connection. Looks pretty similar to what we had before, but you can see our we're, we're yellow now instead of orange. That's good because I've got my key on the left here. Uh, orange is unrestricted. Yellow is connected to or affects the security of. So this time our firewall rule says from A to B, service SSH accept any, any, any block. So this is going to let A communicate to B just on SSH. That is not unrestricted connectivity anymore. It's restricted to a specific port service or protocol. And therefore system A is in scope, but it is not part of the CDE. So we've got our CDE environment over here. We've got our in scope, not CDE environment over here. So hooray, we've, re we've reduced our scope at least a little bit because now we don't have to apply CDE controls to that workstation. Indirect connectivity gets a little more complex. So here, uh, this is an example with a jump box. And we can see here how system A can connect to system B according to the firewall real rules here using remote desktop protocol. And now once our user on system A is connected to system B, they can, using this next firewall rule, establish a connection to system C over SSH. So it's not unrestricted connectivity. We're just limiting this to the SSH port. So, so we don't have to drag B in and turn it orange and make it part of the CDE. But the reality here is that system A is in scope because the user at system A is establishing that indirect connection to system C and system C is part of the CDE. And um, to think about this from a risk perspective, if you had malware on system A, that's capturing credentials and doing all the other things that malware would do, that's able to intercept the information that the malware needs to let the hacker basically exploit this same path, jump to the jump box, and then get from there into the, uh, the CDE. So the text from PCI scoping and segmentation guidance document, section three, makes very clear that systems are in scope even when a connection is limited to specific ports, services, protocols on specific systems. And it also makes clear that a system must not provide an access path between the CDE systems and out of scope systems. So using a jump box like this, it, it would violate this rule if we said workstation A is out of scope. So therefore workstation A has to be in scope. So the early days of PCI, this was not as clear as it is now. I had a lot of clients that would do the jump box thing and, and try to say that, yep, everything outside the jump box is out of scope. New guidance that has come out over the years. There's uh, plenty of diagrams in this uh, information supplement that show a whole lot of different scenarios, much more complex than what I have here, but very clear that a jump box does not get things out of scope. And now for our definition of isolated. Uh, this one's pretty simple there must be no connectivity between the out of scope system and the CDE. So we can see our, our firewall rule from A to B, any service block. Cool, A is isolated from B, A is out of scope. Keep in mind, if you just see a block rule like this in your firewall, that's not enough to just completely rule it out because you still may have that uh, indirect connectivity like we showed in the previous example. Um, I didn't highlight it, but there was a any, any, any block rule in that firewall rule set so that system A was not allowed to talk directly to the system C and the CDE. So you still need, even if you see this, you still need to check to make sure there's no indirect connections going on. So now let's look at some more realistic network examples, some, some kind of real world things rather than just two boxes in a firewall. And here we can see uh, we've got our uh, card data comes in from the internet to our web server, and then it goes on to our database. So that means our firewall, the switch, the web server, and the database are all storing, processing, transmitting account data. Uh, this is a flat network though. Notice the firewall is just up here and everything's connected to the same switch. So everything, on this network has unrestricted connectivity to the web server, the database, the firewall, the switch. So that means everything on this network is part of the cardholder data environment. It's in scope for all the PCI requirements that apply to the CDE. And in theory, you could make this type of environment compliant, but I've never seen it done. Just trying to apply 
all of the PCI CDE requirements to everything on your entire network is just, that's an insane task. So, uh, so you want to avoid this. Um, and keep in mind, this could be the same if, if there was, if these were all VLANs with a firewall in the middle and that firewall is not restricting internal traffic, still counts, everything's in scope, just like our earlier example. So we can reduce scope by using VLANs. And in this example, we're assuming this firewall is doing some meaningful packet filtering, of course. So as before, uh, we've got that card data coming in, our web server, our database, the switches and the firewall are all handling account data. Uh, we've still got some problems though. The way we've segmented this out, we have our domain controller, our SIM and our email server are on the same VLANs as the database and the web server. That gives them unrestricted connectivity to something that's storing, processing, transmitting account data. And so that, that makes them part of the CDE. So um, even though they're not doing that themselves. So our admin workstation way over here on the right, sys administrator. Generally your administrator is always gonna be in scope because they're connecting to and doing all sorts of configuration stuff on the, uh, on the CDE and the other in scope systems. So we've got our system administrator in scope. But where this gets messy is when our accounts workstation and our CEO decide to check their email because that email server is part of the cardholder data environment. So when they connect in there, that makes them connected to the CDE and puts them in scope for PCI as well. Uh, nobody wants their CEO's workstation to be in scope for PCI, that's a bad day. So, uh, so you can do it this way. We've, we've reduced our scope somewhat. At least we've got our voice over IP phones out of scope. And at least these workstations are no longer part of the CDE compared to the previous example, but, uh, but we can do better. So let's break it down some more. Uh, here, we've put our web server on its own VLAN, and we've also moved all the account data to a new database on its own VLAN, so our old database over here can keep doing whatever non-PCI stuff it was doing. Sometimes it makes sense to just spin up a separate system to handle the account data. So uh, same data flow as before, web server, database, cardholder data environment, the usual, exactly what we would expect. Uh, now, when it comes to things like our domain controller and our SIM, they are likely in scope for PCI because they're likely providing security services to the database, to the web server. But notice they're not part of the CDE anymore. They don't have that unrestricted connectivity to the database, the web server. In theory here, their VLAN is going through that firewall that's doing some meaningful packet filtering before sending those connections on. So direct connection, um, affects the security of, yep, in scope for PCI, but now they're not part of the CDE, which means our system administrator, again, usually in scope, but our CEO is free to check email without falling in scope for PCI. So, uh, so that's good news here. Uh, remember that systems only get pulled into scope if they connect to or affect the security of the CDE not the broader category of in-scope systems. So even though this domain controller in the SIM may be providing security for the other database, the email, the CEO, whoever, they're not dragging those other systems into scope because they're not CDE. Um, that keeps our scope nice and small. So let's take our nice simple diagram now. Let's add a little bit more complexity. And let's say we've decided we're gonna start taking credit cards over the phone. So we've got a new data flow comes in to our voice over IP phone for the accounting system. And we're gonna have a human being who's in scope, answers that phone and punches that account data into their workstation. And then from their workstation that goes out to the processor. So we've created a new CDE within this environment. Uh, the key thing to note here is we've got some other voice over IP phones on that same VLAN as the phone that's handling account data. That sounds like unrestricted connectivity to me. And so here we are once again with uh, a bigger, oh, my graphics messed up a little there. Um, those two phones should be, should be orange. Uh, so we've got a bigger CDE here. So you just have to think about this as, again, don't think of CDE as a specific place on the network. 
think of it as certain systems have that CDE flag and you need to think about what can talk to the systems with the CDE flag or what can affect the security of the systems with the CDE flag. Uh, I briefly mentioned critical systems before. Uh, PCI defines this extra category of critical systems, applies a few requirements to them, which are listed here. You don't need to think too much about this right now as it's not a part of this core scoping, but it's part of this trend in PCI DSS where they, they come up with these terms to categorize certain things so they can apply a few specific requirements to them like these four. And these are the only four requirements that mention critical systems. So this is just kind of to point out, we've got the definition up here. Again, think about what's a critical system to you under this definition. And as you're going through doing your scoping exercise, apply that critical system flag, just like you would apply the CDE flag to anything that you consider critical. And the definition says systems that store, process, or transmit cardholder data are critical, uh, but also public facing devices, security systems, databases. So, um, so you'll, you'll likely have other things that fit this, this definition as well. So um, just something, something extra to think about as you're doing your scoping exercise. They also, just like critical systems, they throw these terms trusted and untrusted networks at us. And there's another one in here somewhere, open public networks. So again, we've got, what do we have here? Six different requirements that mention trusted or untrusted networks or open public networks. Again, not a part of your core scoping. These are just things that they're using to more narrowly apply certain requirements. So the way to think about this, uh, these definitions are straight out of the PCI DSS glossary. Trusted networks are networks that you control or manage that meet the applicable PCI requirements. And untrusted networks are all other networks. So that's pretty straightforward. Uh, the internet networks that belong to your organization's partner companies or your customers, all examples of untrusted networks because they are not under your controller management. And that part of the definition here about meeting applicable PCI requirements is important because you may have networks that are under your control, but you've decided are out of scope for PCI, just like in our last example, uh, when the first time around the voice P phones were out of scope. Therefore, you have not implemented PCI controls on those networks. So that means these are untrusted networks according to this definition, even though they are under your control, and all of those requirements on that previous slide that mention connections between trusted and untrusted networks will apply to connections between your own in-house out of scope networks and your in-house in scope networks. So, uh, so that one trips people up a little bit sometimes. So just pay very close attention to the wording in those requirements. Uh, both trusted and untrusted networks can also be open public networks. Uh, if you read the definition here, the internet, most obvious example of an open untrust, uh, open public network that is untrusted because you don't control it. It doesn't comply with PCI DSS, therefore untrusted network. Uh, but their definition also includes wireless technologies, Wi-Fi, Bluetooth. So if you use a wireless network as part of your in-scope environment, or even as part of your CDE that is allowed, you would need to apply the PCI DSS requirements to uh, to for open public networks to that wireless network because the in-scope wireless networks under your control meets the applicable requirements considered trusted uh, and so that the big requirement for open public networks is encrypting transmitted pans account numbers so of course you need to encrypt account numbers before you send them over the internet some people don't realize this you do not have to encrypt account numbers when you transmit them over your internal networks unless it is an open public network, such as a wireless network. So just nuance, detail, things to pay attention to as you're designing your network security. So that takes us out of the technology and into the physical scope. Uh, everybody forgets about PCI having a physical scope. So the easy way to think about this is any site that contains people, processes, or technology that are in scope for PCI is also the site itself is in scope. So just like with our networks and systems, though, there's a few categories within this scope definition we can use uh, as sort of a physical segmentation to reduce the scope. So more 
obnoxious PCI terms that are scattered throughout specific requirements related to physical security in this case that they use to narrow these down. Um, things like facility, publicly accessible, CDE, and sensitive area. And so we can think of kind of physical security layers. Uh, these requirements are all, you know, again, they, they say right in the top of requirement nine, all of these requirements are only meant to apply to the areas that fall into those categories. And facility is the most complex of these because PCI tells us all this stuff managed more broadly, often exist outside of a CDE or sensitive area, may exist at different places within a facility, building entry or at an internal entrance. So they get really kind of wishy-washy with this. Uh, it basically, it gives you a lot of flexibility in how you implement any of these controls that refer to the facility. Maybe it's at the front door of the building, maybe it's at an interior door to a protected space, maybe it's somewhere in between, that's up to you, uh, as long as it's somewhere. And it's also important to realize there's overlap between these definitions. So basically all these other categories will be part of a facility, but uh, both sensitive areas and public areas may or may not be part of your CDE. And so of course we need to define what is a sensitive area. So here's our definition, uh, again, unhelpfully vague, typically a subset of the CDE, typically, not always, houses systems considered critical to the CDE. Uh, more helpfully, they give us a list of what this includes and what it excludes. So, um, so we can see here areas where only point of sale terminals are present are excluded from sensitive areas. That's a huge help. But in general, you can think of a sensitive area as any location that contains your network infrastructure, your security systems, or large amounts of account data, either electronic or paper or both uh, collected together. Unfortunately, PCI does a pretty poor job of defining the physical CDE. Um, this is going back to their, their broad definition of the CDE itself. And um, you know, it says system components, people, and processes, doesn't say anything about locations. So I have my little invisible and places in here that is kind of how I treat it, but this is very much open to interpretation because they haven't gotten more specific. So the easy way, consider any location that has electronic or paper account data to be part of your physical CDE. Uh, I think that's a, a pretty broadly applicable way of putting that, that few people would argue with. So let's do some more diagrams some visuals here, just like we did before for our networks. Here's a simple retail store. And you can see we have our large publicly accessible store space. So we've got a key here on the left in blue. Um, so that's publicly accessible and there'll be requirements that apply to that, like don't have just open network jacks unprotected out there in the publicly accessible space so that your customers can put rogue wireless devices on your network. Uh, and then uh, we've got a checkout on the right side that is your CDE and you can kind of see it blends a little bit here. So um, we've got account data present on the point of sale system. So definitely CDE but it's not a sensitive area because our definition that we just looked at specifically excludes point of sale areas. Meanwhile, we've got our back office here that has like our switching infrastructure and our firewall. So this is likely CDE because the point of sale systems have to transmit that cardholder data to the internet somehow. And so it's probably going through the switch in the firewall, but it's also a sensitive area because this is our network infrastructure. And we saw that is in the included in the definition side of sensitive area. So we would need extra physical controls basically at this door to the back office that we wouldn't necessarily need out here in the retail store. And this goes into things like uh, being able to track individual access, cameras, things like that. Um, a note here on the left, PCI has physical requirements about logging and escorting visitors. They've explicitly excluded your customers that are just there to buy stuff from their definition of visitors. So you don't have to log every customer that comes into this cardholder data environment in your point of sale system. But uh, that doesn't mean you can just go let them wander into the back office. This is where I'd expect your, uh, your visitor logging and escorting to kick in is uh, in the back office there. A little more complex example is uh, we've got kind of more of an office space. Uh, you can see we've got our lobby here, our in-person customer service areas that are publicly accessible. 
just like our retail store, we've got a point of sale here. So this area blends between publicly accessible and CDE. Um, CDE also includes our telephone order department, our mail order department, and our data center. Just like that back office, we're going to have cardholder data moving through the data center on its way to the internet from whatever else we're doing here with it. Uh, the uh, mail order department and the data center are also sensitive areas because large amounts of account data are handled in the mail order department and data center, again, network infrastructure. Building security ID to IT department, sensitive areas, because they're the ones providing security to the CDE. You know, our, our building security has the badge system, the camera recordings, IT departments doing all the sysadmin stuff. So, uh, so this is kind of just like you do a network diagram. It may be helpful to kind of map out your facility and figure out what are our CDEs? What are our sensitive areas? Where are we going to put these facility controls? Uh, are we going to badge visitors up here as they enter the facility from the lobby? Or are we going to badge visitors as they walk into the data center or the IT department or the mail order department? So uh, all, those, all those decisions that come with that wishy-washy definition of facility here where the green area, you have a lot of flexibility about where you put things in here, where you put your security controls. The big one that always comes up, work from home. Fortunately, we have a PCI FAQ for that that tells us the work from home environment is not considered a sensitive area and they're not required to meet certain specific PCI requirements. Does not mean they're out of scope. Uh, they are still, you know, things should be physically secured there. Just it's not a sensitive area. It doesn't have those additional requirements that apply to sensitive areas. Uh, and there's, there's also some other FAQs that exclude the work from home environment from your annual assessment. So you're not going to have your, your QSA showing up at your employees' homes and demanding to see their physical security. But again, that doesn't mean that physical security requirements do not apply to employees' homes. You should have policies around this kind of thing. So bringing it all home, now that we've talked about our, our technology scope and our physical scope, uh, hopefully we've got a better idea of what needs to be included in our scope. So let's revisit those specific points for requirement. To screenshot some of these examples uh, because there's, we've come up with that we've created to help support this. Totally not part of any official PCI template, uh, just things that you might uh, kind of as you do your Five two octane fields that support other PCI requirements that are kind of related to critical systems. Twelve five two doesn't say you have to document them, but hey, on your scope anyways, you might as well flag which ones are critical systems. With our first two points. Slides with the actual with the I think we're having a little bit of a technical difficulty, Chris. I think you're breaking up a little bit. Identify all our data flows per requirement one, two, four, which is holograms. Your data flows. You're now now. Can you hear me? You're breaking up a little bit, Chris. You're cutting in and out there for a few seconds or a few minutes. See if it was the headset. Can you hear me any better now? Yep, can hear you. All right. Um, yeah, maybe the headset was dying on me. Let me get the screen share started here again. Okay. All right. Sorry about that. So, um, so yeah. So this is our, you know, our our descriptions here. Basically, it's just a step by step description of what happens to the account data from the moment it enters your environment to the moment you destroy it, and. Uh, it could be very short, like our top example here, or it could be much longer. And it really just depends on how complex each of your payment processes are. 
Next thing it tells us, identify all locations where account data stored process transmitted. Well, we just covered that with our physical security. So again, just an example of what you can document here. Again, not a requirement, but if you're writing this down, you might as well document what you consider to be your sensitive areas. Um, tells us to identify all system components in the CDE connected to the CDE or that can impact the security of the CDE. And if you've been paying attention, that sounds a lot like the definition of exactly what's in scope for PCI DSS. So that's the simple way to put this is document everything that's in scope for PCI DSS. So here's our example. Um, you can see I put the critical system flag here just to, to kind of have something to, to help us. I put our in scope reason over here. Um, this function field is related to, there's another requirement for an inventory, uh, 1251, that tells you to document the function of each of your systems in scope. So if you're writing it down, you might as well put the function in here so it's all in one spot. There's a catch though, is if we go to the definition for system components, because this says identifying all system components, our definition for system components says network devices, servers, computing devices, virtual components, or software. So it's not just the devices you need to inventory, you need to inventory all of your software that is running on a device that is in scope for PCI. And this is where everybody's probably screaming right now, but um, when you read it, it, it's hard to read it and not say that software needs to be part of this. But there are some new requirements in 4.0 specifically about bespoke or custom software, about third-party components in the bespoke and custom software. So. It's, it's becoming much more clear that, yeah, you need a software inventory as part of this for your vulnerability management. Segmentation controls need to be documented, uh, including justification for any environments being out of scope. So not only do you need to document all of your in-scope stuff, you should be using this to document everything that is that you have decided this network is out of scope. You need to document why you think it is out of scope in here. So, um, so just another example here showing how you can accomplish this using, you know, our, our VLAN IDs, some subnets, what segmentation controls are there, what's in scope, what's out of scope, why are you considering them out of scope? So using all those things that we talked about, you know, firewall filtering, isolation, all those other terms, that's how you justify something being out of scope. The last kind of detail they want you to write down here, identifying all third uh, third parties with access to the CDE. So just a simple, yeah, who is it? Why are they accessing it? How are they connecting? We'll get you through this one. And so wrapping it all up, they want you to confirm that all data flows, account data system components, segmentation controls, connections are included in your scope. So, uh, so this is that like every 12 months or after a significant change or every six months if you're a service provider, uh, going through and just signing off and saying, yep, this scope documentation is accurate. So just have a sign-off sheet or a log at the, the bottom of your scope document where people can just sign off and say, yes, I reviewed this and maybe log any changes that they made um, so that you can show your auditor this is being done. And these boxes I added here, these are just my thoughts on points to consider when you're doing these reviews. Uh, one of the biggest problems we run into is somebody makes changes to payment processes, or maybe they even add a whole new payment process, but they don't properly communicate it within the organization to like IT or security or the compliance people. So like it should be in scope, except nobody knows it exists other than the person who just like signed it up, signed up for a Shopify account or something. So, um, so make sure to go out and ask these questions about like, has anybody done any of this stuff and accidentally increased your scope without realizing that PCI is like a thing? You know, falling back into that trap of, oh, this is completely outsourced. We have no scope when really you should at least be doing that 12.8 and 12.10.1 stuff. Uh, another big concern is data leakage. Um, you know, there's a, something in here about um, cardholder data outside the expected places. And this one, a lot of people are saying you need to go out and scan for account data outside of your CDE. It doesn't say that. It, it says you can use tools to scan for account data outside of your CDE. So it is not a requirement. It's just guidance. Uh, however, your QSA is supposed to scan for account data outside of your CDE as part of your annual assessment. So um, you would probably much rather find that stuff on your own before your annual assessment rather than having your QSA find it 
during the annual assessment. And now your report is delayed until you clean it up and all this other stuff. So um, so that's a, a strong recommend that you have some sort of tools out there to look for that account data uh, that leaked out from the intended CDE. So that brings us to the top of the hour. Um, and I know we've, we've got a few questions here and um, I think I got a, a couple minutes here I can hang on and let's, let's see what we've got here. Um, if a log source is recording PCI data like a SIM, would that pull the SIM in scope? Yes, for multiple reasons. Um, number one, if you accidentally end up with account data in your SIM, like it somehow logs a credit card number, that's super bad because now your SIM is part of your cardholder data environment and anything else that it connects to is in scope for PCI. So definitely don't do that. But uh, the, the more common scenario is you're using the SIM to secure your cardholder data environment, your other in-scope systems. Yes, it's in scope because of that rule about, well, PCI has requirement 10 is all about logging and alerting and monitoring. One of those requirements essentially says you have to have a SIM. So if you're using this SIM to meet that requirement, the SIM is supporting a PCI requirement and therefore it's definitely in scope. Uh, if I'm using a validated P2P e-solution, does that pull the network devices out of scope? Controversial. Um, the, there's, most QSAs will say yes, although there's nothing clear black and white in PCI DSS that says that. That's just kind of the, well, all the data is encrypted. You don't have the decryption keys. So you're kind of like a third party with, you know, the, my, my example earlier of the backups where you don't have the decryption key. Uh, the better answer is to look at the P2PE instruction manual. If you have a real validated P2PE solution that is not one of like the fake end-to-end -end encrypted, not validated things, it must come with a P2PE instruction manual from the solution provider that is going to be unique to every solution. And that will tell you what security controls you need to put in place outside of PCI DSS to qualify for the P2PE scope reduction. So read the PIM, the P2P instruction manual carefully. And if it says like, you don't need to worry about the network devices, excellent. You don't need to worry about them. If it says you do need to worry about them, you do need to worry about them. But when I come in as a QSA and you followed the, the P2P instruction manual, you qualify for the P2P SAQ type, the P2P SAQ includes very, very, very few of the requirements. Basically the only thing in there is physical tamper checks. I'm putting my compliance blinders on and I am just looking at the requirements that SAQA tells me to look at. I'm not going to ask you about the requirement one firewall stuff because it's not in there. So it's a bit of a gray area, unfortunately, but for the most part, yeah, you can get away with, I wouldn't officially say the network devices are out of scope, but I'm not going to ask about them as a QSA because it doesn't tell me to. Um, Special considerations around newly added Wi-Fi testing in version four. Um, nothing too special, just kind of from our scope perspective here. Again, like considering that, look closely at it and see like what does it apply to and how does it apply. And uh, we've always had the broad wireless testing that like even if you don't have wireless, you should always be looking for rogue wireless. Again, that person that like plugged in a rogue hotspot behind the Coke machine. Not that I ever did that during my pen testing days or anything, but um but you will have certain specific wireless requirements as they relate to the CDE. So just read each of those wireless requirements closely. 1041 business days or calendar days, usually calendar days. Um, there are some that talk about like 24 seven monitoring in that. So that's, you know, it's again, it's a bit of a gray area, but when I have other log requirements that talk about 24 seven, that kind of implies to me that yeah, they they mostly mean calendar days. And for anybody not following along, 1041, that's one of the uh, the logging, log review requirements. Um, software that supports PCI processing only or all software in the CDE. I would say if if that software is running on a device that is in scope for PCI DSS, that software is in scope. Um, so yeah, beyond the CDE, it's, it's any in scope devices. Um, other locations, like, yeah, no, it's, it really comes down to just if it's in, if the device is in scope for PCI, the software running on it's in scope for PCI. If you have something like say, you know, windows or a certain Linux distribution that just like comes by default with a whole bunch of other packages, 
I wouldn't expect you, this is deep in the gray area, my own interpretation. I wouldn't expect you to list like Windows 10 and here's like the five pages of garbage that Windows 10 automatically installs. Um, we all know that junk comes with Windows 10 or whatever Linux distro you're running. So just say, hey, we're running Windows 10 release whatever or Debian Linux release whatever. And if you add packages on top of what comes by default, I would expect those additional packages to be in your inventory. Um, pan scope distinction made when using a card number as a loan account number. I'm going to have to punt here and give you the official PCI answer, which is the same for things like um, the uh, the one-time use cards and all that sort of stuff is you have to ask the card brands and your acquiring bank because they have their own weird rules that are outside of PCI DSS that they change. And I feel like every time I ask and I get an answer, then they change their answer again. So I'm always wrong. So my default answer now is you need to ask your acquiring bank and your pro your account uh, card brands if you're working with Amex and discover how they want it treated. Uh, but, uh, and you kind of go into here in your question a little bit about like um, checking account statements. If If that 16 digit number on the checking account statement is usable as a Visa or a MasterCard or an Amex or Discover, yeah, that's a PAN. That should be treated as in scope unless they tell you otherwise. Again, your acquiring bank, your card brands, they can do whatever they want. That's outside my domain. But by default, if I could type that number into a website and buy stuff off Amazon with it, I would consider it a PAN. I'd consider it in scope until proven otherwise. Um, same thing for like loan applications where you're listing credit card accounts. A PAN's a PAN. Uh, until until you have something in writing from an acquirer or from your card brands that say it's not, it's in scope. Um, SAQD provider, if cardholder data and sensitive authentication are encrypted, P2PE, even before reaching your switches, are we absolved from some controls? Um, yes, and that's where the thing that comes in that if, if there's there is absolutely no way to decrypt that data in your environment. Not only are you absolved from some controls, you're you're pretty much out of scope for anything related to store transmit uh, requirements three and four uh, about encrypting. You know that the data is it's all it's all out of your control. The only thing I'd say you're on the hook for are any requirements you're handling on behalf of your customers. So this is where that responsibility matrix comes in. Requirement twelve eight five and twelve nine two of very clearly documenting as your service provider, here are the requirements we're handling on your behalf. I have some service providers that um, their whole thing is we want to make this as easy for our customers as possible. So we're going to take every responsibility we can possibly take from our customers and do it on our own. Uh, so our customers will, will be happy with us and they will we will have more customers who want to keep paying us money. I have other service providers that say we want nothing to do with PCI. We want our scope as small as possible. And they put out a responsibility matrix that says, hey, customer, this is all your problem. We are going to do the absolute bare minimum that we need to do to make you not PCI noncompliant. Sorry, double negative there. But um, that's kind of the point, though, is, is they're, they're doing the bare minimum to avoid the client falling out of compliance. So very much a business decision of do you want to be the happy service provider that, that takes all these requirements on for your clients or not? Um. CCTV data, CCTV system in a data center as applied to scope. Data center provides physical space, internet connection for CDE. This gets into, let me see if I can quote requirement numbers off the top of my head. Always a bad idea. I want to say it's 10 to 1, 1. Could be wrong on that one. Um, there's a physical requirement for the facility that just says appropriate entry controls. And then it has a sub requirement that applies to sensitive areas. Sensitive areas are where you need um, the individual accountability. So it could be a door badge where every person swipes their door badge in. So you know this person walked through this door at this time. Or it could be a camera. So you can see that person walk through that door and visually identify them. Or it could be both. But it could be either or. So I always tell everybody, if you've got a door badge system and you can use that to meet that requirement, you don't need the cameras. You, you may have them but they're not necessarily part of what you're using to meet the PCI requirement. So you can just kind of ignore them. Um, but if you have them, if you're using them, yep, they're in scope. Um, as long as they're not like looking at cardholder data, which would be crazy to do that. 
they're in scope, they're security systems, they're used to meet that PCI requirement that I just mentioned. So um, so it's just another it's just another in scope thing that you need to apply all of those in scope requirements to, but not part of the CDE. So uh, your your scope there, your number of requirements that you apply would be fairly limited because of the, you know, it's not encrypt, it's not storing or processing or transmitting cardholder data. So requirements three and four completely go away. Um, CCTV camera, you got to make that decision. Well, do we need anti malware on this? There's a whole bunch of stuff about that. Um, logging and alerting, like basically apply every control to them that you can reasonably apply to those cameras and the the recording system. So yeah, looks like that is the end of the question list. So hopefully that was uh, helpful for everybody. Um, yeah, scoping is is one of the big things here. So if um, you know, if you need any help with this, more deep dive, uh, everybody's unique, unfortunately. I, I wish there was a one size fits all answer. I'm sad I didn't get to my weird stuff section because I was gonna get into like trunked VLANs and just all sorts of other weirdness that messes with the scope. So um, if you have the weird stuff, send us an e email, give us a call and uh, we're here to help. So thanks for coming today, everybody. And uh, I think that'll wrap it up. Unless Patrick, you had anything else? Nope, that's it. Thanks everybody for like joining us and uh, have a great day.